Hi there, I'm Ron, and welcome back to Farbless Creations. A lot of my creative projects are on the back burner right now as I work to finish wiring and completing my garage shop conversion, so I decided to dig back in my archives a little bit. What do I mean by that? Well, if you've seen the video where I create a custom wedding sign for my cousin Emily and her husband Alex, you know that I recorded the process of making that sign well before I started this YouTube channel and then edited together the video once I had. Well, we have the exact same story here. My good friends Taylor and Brad got married a few years ago too, actually about a month before Alex and Emily did, and I recorded the footage to eventually, just maybe, one day make a video out of. Their wedding sign was the first one I ever made, and while it maybe has a few imperfections, I still loved how it turned out. So with all that said, let's dive in and see how it was created. To start, let's take a look back at my design file, as I apparently didn't record my screen as I was in the process of designing it, but we can still review some of its iterations. Taylor and Brad had decided on a fairly minimalistic approach to their wedding collateral, so I was able to take some creative liberties with the design. Despite this, I still use typefaces similar to those that were used in their invitation. For the outer shape of the sign, I played a lot here, but eventually I landed on the semi-formal look that was achieved with the help of Illustrator's Live Corner tool. By default, it just makes a rounded corner, but if you alt-click a few times on the anchor point, you get this inverted rounded corner, which looks really nice when two 90-degree corners are fully rounded to meet in the middle. One thing you may notice here right away is a bit of improper grammar. When you're making a last name plural by saying the Johnsons, or in this case, the Perkles, you do not add an apostrophe. I learned this after making and gifting their sign. Tay Tay, if this is secretly driving you nuts in your sign these three years later, please, please tell me so I can make you a new sign without this mistake. We're friends. You won't hurt my feelings. So with the design finalized, despite the grammar faux pas, I could get to prepping my materials. For the backing board, I decided to use 3 quarter inch solid pine so that I could cut it on the laser cutter. I go into a lot more detail in the Alex and Emily video, but pine is fairly soft, so the laser can cut through it like butter, even at that thickness. I'd have preferred to make it out of a nicer hardwood, since I wasn't going for a rustic look here like I was with Alex and Emily's sign, but the laser has a hard time cutting through hardwoods without scorching when they're much thicker than a quarter inch. For thick hardwoods, a CNC would be a much better choice, so I'm eager to get my hands on one of those someday. Despite its great cutting abilities on the laser, pine is notorious for having knots sprinkled throughout the boards, so I carefully cut around all the knots present in my 8-foot board so that the scrap boards could be used for other projects. After a little measuring to find the length that would be best for my design, I sanded the surface down really well so that I would have minimal sanding to do later. I wanted the board to have a really good surface starting out because some of the lettering would be laser etched directly onto the board, and sanding too much away later could erase these etched features. One of the features I decided to etch was the text used for secondary lettering, the text at the top and the bottom of the sign, because the typeface used here was super thin and narrow and just wouldn't work cutting the letters out individually, as they would be super fragile. After the sanding, I was ready to head to the laser. I did a few test etchings of the 2B etched features on one of my offcuts to see what settings I liked best. I wanted the text to be dark, and when you're just etching pine, sometimes it can appear quite light and golden instead of dark and charred. I was hoping for the latter, so that result was achieved by doing two passes of the etch on top of one another and then doing a perimeter vector cut of the letters to sharpen the borders of the etchings. With my settings noted, I could get started etching the actual sign. Whenever doing anything semi-complex like a wedding name sign with lots of individual parts, I like to break the design file up into layers so it's easy to focus on one part at a time so the old laser at the makerspace doesn't get confused, <laughs> or me for that matter, and I know exactly what part I'm working on. To start, I did my inset decorative border first. This was achieved by putting the laser out of focus by about one half to three quarters of an inch and turning the power down low as to just slightly char the surface without burning away any material. After that, I etched the last name and the wedding date. As I described earlier, I decided to do these in multiple passes to darken them up. It's a little hard to see here, but as the laser completes its second pass, the text is darker towards the top and lighter at the bottom where it has yet to complete the second pass. To wrap up this text group, I performed that vector perimeter pass to clean up the raster edges and to make everything look nice and crisp. This has the added benefit of adding a little extra scorching to the insides of the letter to make them even darker, which, again, with pine, is a plus. After that group of text was done, it was time to etch myself some glue guidelines for the primary text. This text will be cut out separately and glued on top, so to make sure I glue it in exactly the right spot, I turned the power down very low and did a very light pass of the outlines of these letters. Finally, with all the features of the pine board done, it was time to cut it out. Now as I said earlier, this is 3 quarter inch pine, which is a bit thick, but by focusing the laser at the center of the board rather than the surface, 
the energy can be dissipated evenly throughout the cut. I explain it better in the Alex and Emily video, so if you're interested in learning more about that technique, be sure to check out that video at the end of this one, where I'll have a link ready for you. After the cutout pass was complete, I carefully held the board in place as I made sure it released from the surrounding scrap in case I needed to do one more pass to fully free it. But it came away cleanly without any fuss. After a little cleanup of the back and edges with some sandpaper, I could turn my focus to the primary lettering. As part of my laser file prep procedure, I optimized and tightened up the lettering to save space on the wood. I then cut this text out of a piece of what I believe was maple veneer plywood. After they were cut, I could stain them to really stand out and add contrast to the finished design. Now I know what you're thinking, because three years later, I'm thinking the same thing as I edit this video. Why didn't you stain the board before cutting all the letters out, Ron? I don't know. For whatever reason, it didn't occur to me. Maybe I was looking for one of those slow-going, semi-meditative woodworking tasks I've described in past videos. Who knows? If you're making one of these, I highly encourage you to do the staining before you cut to make your life a little easier. Or don't. It's totally up to you. You are, after all, the Margaret Lee Shutterly of how much work staining your letters be. After our individually stained and cut letters were fully dried and the stain was fully cured, we could glue them to our sign. To do this, I did a little bit of finger painting with the wood glue, where I would apply a small amount of glue to a few letters, place them in their respective place on the sign, and then use a large steel plate as a clamp for a few moments until the letters had done their initial drying. A chunk of granite would apparently also work here. After all the letters were placed and the glue was fully cured, it was time to apply the finish to protect it for the years to come. I decided to use Minwax quick drying oil based polyurethane for this, which sprays pretty nicely and looks super slick in semi gloss, in my opinion. Semi gloss is just enough sheen to catch your eye, but not so much that it could be a mirror or show every finger that has ever touched it. I did multiple coats of the poly, sanding between them to get the best finish possible. Now, to clarify that, obviously sanding between all the letters would be a darn near impossible task, so the sanding between coats largely focused on the large open areas and the top surface of the primary lettering. Compressed air or an air compressor comes in handy to blow out the sanding dust before applying the next coat. With the finish complete and looking good, I gently placed the finish sign face down on a soft bed of paper towels and proceeded to add some hanging hardware. I've experimented with keyhole slots cut on the router over the years too, but I find those work best on smaller projects. For larger things like signs, picture hanging wire works best. To apply, I added the D bracket on both sides of my sign and twisted the wire through to secure. I then proceeded to hang it up and take a photo for my portfolio when I noticed a slight problem with the placement of my hanging hardware. The center of gravity was higher up on the sign than where I placed my hardware, causing the sign to tilt down at a somewhat significant degree. To solve for this, yet keep the wire from being visible when hung, I had to shorten the wire and relocate the D-rings further up on the same trajectory as the original wire. If I had added the hardware further up but on the same edges of the sign, it's possible that the wire would be visible on the inside corners of the top of the sign which I did not want. After fixing the placement and doing another test hang, it was finally complete. All that was left at this point was wrapping it up in craft paper and twine for that rustic charm I love so much and delivering it to Taylor and Brad on their special day. And of course, taking some pretty silly photos with them at their photo booth. I really hope you enjoyed that in-depth look at the process behind making this custom wedding sign for Taylor and Brad. A lot of heart goes into everyone I make, so I hope that shows in my process. We haven't had any friends or family members get married over the past few years, so it's nice having the opportunity to look back on this project and reminisce a little bit. And I'm super excited for the next opportunity I get to create a wedding sign like this. If you're looking for any of the specific materials or tools I used in this video, I'll provide links down in the description below. And finally, I don't ask for this a lot, but if you enjoyed this video, I sure would appreciate if you gave me a thumbs up and subscribed to my channel. It let me know that this is the type of project you really enjoy seeing and encourage me to make more like it in the future. And if you do want to see more like it in the future, be sure to hit the bell icon too so that YouTube notifies you the next time I release videos just like this one. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you in the next one, and until then, cheers!